Okay, we're all here. Um, hi, Lisa, let me get over here and share my screen. Give me one second here. Okay, um, so we're just gonna give it a couple minutes to let you know a couple more people come on. Um, it's at four o'clock, so I'm Jamie Jones with World Away Travel, and we have Lisa Bain here with Limblad Expeditions. So um, we'll get started in a couple minutes. So Lisa, is it nice out in New York today? Well, I'm I'm one of those tricky phone numbers. I actually live in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> and it, it has it has been delightful today. Yeah, so I'm um. I work remotely, which is which is not bad. I love visiting New York, love spending time there, but um, certainly being in Nashville, a little bit out of town and with a bit of land around me is the perfect place to be at the moment. <laughs> that is really, oh, that is nice. Today's yeah. the first day that we've had nice weather in a while. It's been yeah. rainy and miserable here. We've had a lot of that too, a day of rain, a day of sun, a day of rain. It's um, certainly been a, a damp spring, let's just put it that way. Yep. All right, so um, let's get started. So um, welcome everybody to our first virtual client event, which we're really excited to do. Um, we've been very, very picky about who we're partnering with. Um, and one of the first companies that came to mind was Lindblad Expeditions. And we have Lisa Bain here from Lindblad. She is the Vice President of Sales for North America. Um, she hails from Australia by birth. She's been to over seven continents. Um, and she's been in small ship expedition for 17 years. She doesn't look a day over 23, but, um, <laughs> and, uh, she's been with Lindblad for, for eight years. So she's got a, she's got a lot of experience with expedition cruising, um, and with Lindblad. And I'm Jamie Jones, Vice President of World Away Travel. And I believe that everybody on the webinar is familiar with World Away. If you're not, we're a uh, boutique agency located in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And we, um, we really assist clients with all of their travel needs. Um, so I would like to introduce Lisa to get started. And um, we're really excited to have you, Lisa, so thank you. My pleasure. So Lisa, can you tell me a little bit, um, because a lot of people just don't understand, you know, they want to know what is Lindblad Expeditions. And so can you tell us a little bit of the history of Lindblad? Yeah, I'd love to. So the gentleman you see right here on the screen is a man by the name of Lars Eric Lindblad. And Lars Eric was an explorer in his own right back in the 50s and early 60s. And he was heading to some pretty, pretty remarkable places and very quickly realized that they were already suffering from habitat loss and wildlife loss. And so he decided that to change that, he needed to take uh, inquisitive people with him, show it to them so that they'd become passionate about caring for him. So that's how the very first small ship expedition in the world started. And that started in 1966 when we took the very first guests ever. Now think about not that long ago, but that was the very first expedition to Antarctica, the first time that non-scientific guests had been to Antarctica. And that was with Lars Eric Lindblad. And then the following year, he took the first guests to the Galapagos in 1967. And so he is really renowned as the father of small ship expeditionary travel. Uh, and that's where it was all stemmed from in the very beginning. Now, his son, Sven Lindblad, has been at the helm of the company now for just over 40 years. 
And Sven has grown us from one little red ship that took that very first trip to Antarctica. And now we have 13, definitely 14. And we have created some amazing alliances around the world. One that most people know us for is our alliance with the National Geographic Society. Now this alliance means that your guests get to travel with us aboard our ships. And our ships are called the National Geographic Orion, the National Geographic Explorer. And we do that because of this amazing close relationship with the National Geographic Society. We, we, we work with them to help raise funds through the Limblad National Geographic Fund. We have our National Geographic Photography Program, which means on our key ships, the Orion, the Explorer, and soon to be Endurance, you have a National Geographic photographer. And we get to have some cool data behind our expeditionary teams. And those teams include super cool people. You'd swear by this photo, every expedition leader has a beard, but I promise you the girlies don't. Um, it, it, this, these are men and women who are really passionate about the places we go. They're ornithologists, botanists, marine biologists, um, ethnomusicologists. We have a great guy by the name of Jacob Edgar, who is an ethnomusicologist, so digs into the deep roots of the local musicians and their musical instruments and how that plays to the culture of the places we visit. But we also have these amazing underwater dive teams. We're the only company that has an underwater dive team. And these guys, these young men and women, are in the most remarkable places diving bringing back footage to share with our clients over our recap or our evening updates each evening because trust me even in the coldest places like antarctica and the arctic alaska that marine biodiversity beneath us is simply spectacular and we all need to understand when you're on a ship you're sitting on a huge living organism and so over the 50 or more years that we've been in operation the Limblad family has really introduced all of the technology that today is being used by every expedition company, but that's things like introducing hydrophones so we can hear whale song in Alaska, video microscopes on the bottom left corner here, that allows us to take samplings of water from around the ship and have a look at what is actually in there, how healthy is that marine environment around us. And then you have your ROVs or remote operated vehicles that can go down to a thousand feet and beam back live footage from beneath the ice flow. And then we also on all of our ships have a videographer and their job is to film what's happening on that specific expedition. So at the end, there's this great, really high quality um, DVD. It actually now comes in a little flash drive that looks like a credit card that has all footage from that particular expedition. So it's a great, great gift for guests to take home to remember their experience with Limblad expeditions. Now, all of this is a part of your expeditionary experience and you add to that zodiac. So the zodiac is the way we get you ashore. You'll hear the words like wet landings, which means you're gonna be stepping off into the waves. And in places like Antarctica, we have boots for you to rent that mean you keep your tootsies dry. And in warmer places, we always have a great packing list. So we suggest what you should be wearing when you're getting on and off the ship. But this ensures that we're going to those really remarkable and remote places. We, if there's a dock and they're selling tchotchkes, we're pro probably not going to be taking you there because there are other folks that can do that. Now, along with that, all your kayaking, your paddle boarding, all is included, all of your snorkeling. Now we also have a really comprehensive photography program from our National Geographic photographers on our key vessels, the Orion, the Explorer and the Endurance, to our Limblad National Geographic certified photographers on our other ships. It means they have all the training, they just are not in the pages of the National, Mag National Geographic magazine. Their job is to travel with you, our guests, and to learn, help you learn how to take the best shots, be it aperture, be it from a position of light or but the most important thing they can do is to tell you when to put the camera down right to say get from behind the lens spend some time really seeing it through your own eyes so um what about for those people that are just they're not photographers can you take pictures with your phone is there help for that there is and actually that's a really good question so <laughs> Look, a lot of our clients now just work with their cell phones and cell phones today have got such great camera equipment built into them. And so we will actually have full briefings just on using your cell phone. Um, and it's amazing what we don't know that those things can do. So, um, you know, we will be able to help people in how to do 
the most amazing panoramic shots. Here's a little hint for you. If you're on a family trip or at the moment you're stuck home in the pandemic, if you get everyone to stand in one corner and you start to pan, they all run behind you to the other side of the room. You can get them back looking at each other. It's just a cool photo to send to friends and family about what you're doing stuck in the house. <laughs> um, but we also have um, our B&H photography locker. And that is a super cool locker. It's on most of our ships. And that is state-of-the-art equipment, binoculars, zoom lenses, camera bodies. And you get the chance to check that out in the evenings, use it for a day, get a feel for what it's like to have this professional equipment. So when you get home, you can purchase new stuff and you've had a chance to test drive it out in the field. So all of that is included in your expedition. It's not additional. And that's what an expedition is. It is all encompassing of those things, all those experiences. Very neat. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the next question, which leads into the slide that I had for you is we have a lot of clients that have multi-generational families or they have young children. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what your children's program or your family program is like? Yeah, so we have families in all of our destinations, but what is really cool is several years ago, with the help of the National Geographic, with National Geographic Education, we put together a National Geographic Global Explorer Program. Now, this is aimed at our under 18 year old guests, and it is on all Alaska, all Galapagos, and as of this year, all Baja itineraries. And those tend to be the great entry points to Lindblad expeditions, and we see a lot more of our multi generational families, not all, but a lot on those trips. Um, this is a great opportunity because it's an enrichment program. It's not designed as childcare. A family experience is not when kids are in childcare over here and parents are doing something separate. That's two different vacations. A family experience is when you learn together and that enrichment helps. So we, as the kids get on board, they get their fantastic little field notebook. And I'm gonna show you an example here. These field notebooks are full color and they reference the place that they're visiting. And so this, oh, I'll hold it in front of me so you can see it. These are on the end of their bed and it has wildlife lists. It has places for them to journal. It has experiments that they're going to do, places that they can do their own illustrations when they're out in the field. And so our team will brief them. They'll get to be with our global explorers educator. Then during the day they go out with their family, but they have their list of things to accomplish. And so it really draws the family into the experience as well. And so that's on all of those destinations. And look, we, we do get very young children on board. I would say that in those three destinations, five and up is a great age. Don't underestimate your children at five. They're sponges and they really do love and participate in everything we have to offer. With the Arctic and Antarctica, seven or eight is a great age to think of. If you do have a younger sibling that wants to travel in two or three, certainly they can come. We have the bedding for them. But just know that we don't offer childcare on board. So they really do need to be out in the Zodiacs in the backpack with mum and dad. Okay. Food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody well, loves food. food. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, we have amazing sustainable cuisine on our ships. Anna Estevez on the left here. Anna is unbelievable and she has worked in the places we visit like Alaska and Galapagos. And since the very beginning, we have believed in using local, fresh, seasonal cuisine, because then that refocuses on why you're in these places. You're supporting local farmers, support, supporting local growers, and you get the taste of the region, those regional dishes. So Anna has joined us and she has done an amazing job in Alaska, bringing on fresh berries and we make all our own breads and pastries on board our ships. Now, certainly a bigger ship is going to have multiple restaurant options. We don't have that. The reason we don't have it is the more restaurants you have, the bigger the ship, the bigger the ship, the less places it can go. So our ships very much are designed on utilizing the space so that we get that perfect ratio of access to the places we go and wonderful spaces on board. So one main restaurant, you dine uh, with everyone at the same time in the evening, but you come and go. It's not a rush to fare, but it is all about, you know, having a great selection, really fresh, really flavorable. 
And then seating in the restaurant, um, how, do, how does that usually, or do you have assigned seating or is it open? No, very relaxed. We don't want to force people into that situation. We want them, a, a, an expedition is about a community of fellow travellers, right? So we want people to mix and mingle, get outside your own family group even. Um, and if you're a solo, you get wrapped up into that straight away. And so our restaurant managers are brilliant at when people are coming in saying, oh my gosh, you sat with the Smiths last night, let's get you over to meet someone new tonight or, you know, helping you get groups together. Um, so it is all about building that community throughout the trip and having the opportunity to, to get to know your fellow traveler. They're often as, in, as interesting as the places we're going to. Okay. Ah, the folks who travel with us. This is really cool. So we have couples, we have solos, we have dedicated solos on all of our ship. We have a share program. If you're a solo that wants to get out and meet someone new of the same sex, we'll share you up with somebody. Um, lots of multi-gen families, lots of groups, just friends traveling that love photography or wildlife. Um, you know, it's, it, you can be as active or inactive as you want. There's always options. And Antarctica, you know, the Arctic plunge is a pretty cool thing to do. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. Um, but when you get out of the water, there's always a warm towel and a warm, you know, a lovely um, glass of scotch to drink. So it warms the inside as well as the out. Um, but it is all about maybe pushing yourself a little bit further than you usually would to experience these amazing places. Now, and, and that's awesome, is that, is it clear when clients are looking at different expeditions, like how strenuous they're going to be or what the activity activity level is going to be so that we can make, you know, the right recommendations for them? Yeah. So every, of course, every destination is different. And that's why we have a really amazing expeditionary team that you and your clients can speak to. We get on the phone with you. We help go through each itinerary. Um, but on the whole, with the majority of our trips, if you can do a couple of football fields, you can do the most of our trips. You need to be able to walk and get around. Um, but we know that everyone's a different level, particularly in a multi-generational family, right? So if you've got an older member of the family and a very young, then you want options. So each night at our recap, we're going to say, hey, tomorrow there's a long hike. This is going to be how strenuous it is. So take that into mind. There's a medium hike. There's a very short walk on the beach with a photography. You're going to really spend that couple of hours honing your photographic skills, learning how to get down at sand level and get great photos of sand dollars or maybe it's kayaking and zodiacking. So you always have options. And the key thing is, if you make a decision that night, then the next day you go, you know, I really want to try, you can change. It's not set in concrete. There's certainly flexibility, but it's all about giving you options each day, which is great because then at the end of the day, when you all come back together, you've all seen something a little different of the same area. And it's mm -hmm. great to share all of that and bring it back to the dinner table. That's really awesome. Yeah. Um, this is what I really, this is my favorite place on the whole ship. So we have an open bridge on all of our ships. That means you can go up with a cup of coffee early in the morning or a drink in the evening, sit at the back, just get to chat with the captain and the crew about their experiences. You can look at our digital maps. It's also a brilliant place for spying wildlife. Um, one of my first trips on Limblad, I actually was on one of our smaller ships and the captain, I don't know if you know Australian history, but we were discovered by Captain Cook. Well, one of our captains is Captain Cook. Captain <laughs> so I got to travel with Captain Cook, which was pretty which was pretty cool. But spend time, no matter when you travel with us, spend time up on the bridge because it really does give you a much broader understanding of what it is like to operate on these amazing oceans and seas that we travel across. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, sustainability huge huge part of what we do from the very beginning uh, we approach everything from how do we care for this place how do we put more than we're taking out of this place back into it how do we help the people so that the cultural identity um, if that means hiring locals to work with us so we're supporting that local community and providing income uh, supporting local artisans we have a global gallery on all of our ships and that is um, all of this amazing artwork from around the world, from different artisans we work with, um, supporting the wildlife by, you know, adding, putting money into the local economies. We're also a self-disinfecting fleet, which is kind of a pretty cool thing. Um, about a year ago, 
we started looking at this and it was more on a sustainability level. How can we reduce the use of water? How can we reduce the use of plastic bottles and be cleaner on board of our ships? So we use this photocatalytic system that kills viruses on contact on the ships. And it's pretty cool. So um, yeah, it's kind of fun. We're a self for self disinfecting fleet. Look at and that was, perfect timing. That's kind of perfect timing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this is the largest of our ships. This is the National Geographic Explorer. So 148 guests. That's guests, not cabins. So. It's intimate, small scale, beautiful ships specifically built for the places they go. That's the other thing. Our fleet is not a cookie cutter fleet. Every ship is specific to the place she goes and, and really adds to that. We've got balconies, beautiful. If you can see on the top of the ship, there's a, it looks like a long glass corridor. That's actually the library. And when you're going to the Arctic or Antarctic to sit up there with a warm drink and just watch the icebergs go by and be able to see out um, another hallmark of a good expedition ship is that no matter where you are on that vessel, you'd best be able to see what's happening outside because that's why you're there, right? Um, some of our other ships, and I'm not going to show you them all, but this was our newest ship in the Galapagos. This is the National Geographic Endeavour 2. She's 96 guests. She is a wonderful platform for exploring the islands, and we'll talk more about those in a little while. We also built two brand new ships, the Quest and the Venture. Um, these are brand new ships in 18 and 19. They're only 100 guests, 22 balcony suites, connecting rooms, solo cabins. But these two ships do Alaska and Columbia Snake River down to Baja, California. They then do trips to uh, Costa Rica, Panama, Belize, Guatemala, and then Panama and Colombia, which started earlier this year. So they basically follow the sun. Not a bad job to have. Yeah. And we have some really cool ships around the world that we charter. When, when we charter, that means we as Limblad, it's our trip. So no one else comes on it except Limblad guests. And this is the beautiful little Delphine. She's only 28 guests on the Amazon River. Um, absolutely stunning up in the Pukai Samaria Reserve in the Peruvian Amazon. But we also have the Sea Cloud in the Dalmatian Coast Greek Isles. We have Lord of the Glens on the rivers and lakes in Scotland. So some beautiful ships. And this is our new baby. This is the National Geographic Endurance. She's ready to go. She is just sitting, waiting for all of the silliness to be over, but she is a new state-of-the-art, 126 guests. Um, she's an ice class 5A. That means she can pretty much spend her life in the ice, in the poles. But the pointy nose is not for ice class. The pointy nose is called an X-bow. And that means that that new technology, instead of riding a wave in this type of manner, which kind of makes you feel a little queasy in the tummy sometimes, this ship is designed to cut through the waves and create a much more stable, calm ride in rough weather. So specifically built for places like the Drake Passage and the North Sea, but she is absolutely stunning. 75% balcony suites. She's absolutely beautiful. Wow. So yeah, she's coming soon. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess we want to talk a little bit about the places we love. And of course, one of those would be that very first place we went, which was Antarctica. Um, it is one of those places that gets under your skin once you've been there and you will honestly spend the rest of your life trying to get back there. Um, we are down there for four, four and a half months. So November through end of February. And those four months can be very different in the experience. You'll still, no matter when you go, it is spectacularly beautiful. You see penguins, you see whales, you see, well, you have the opportunity to see whales, penguins, seals, the ice flow. But if you go early in the season, um, November, you're going to see that really amazing sheet ice. And the ship is going to be able to push into it. That's when we get the chance to go cross-country skiing over the Antarctic Ocean, um, snowshoeing. Penguins are there. They're starting to build their little nests. And then as you head towards the end of November, those nesting sites are becoming more frenetic. Um, they're starting to lay eggs. You're starting to get a little bit more melt. Um, that ice is starting to break up a little bit more. And then as you get towards the end of December, those eggs are hatching and now you've got little baby penguins sticking their heads out saying hello. That ice is broken up, so cross-country skiing, that kind of isn't an option anymore and we don't want to lose you into the water beneath. Um, and then as you head into January, now you've got a lot more of those hills have melted. So you actually do have some little muddy areas, the beaches have cleared of ice. Um, and you're able to push further south down the peninsula because that pack ice is broken up. 
And then as you head into February, as you're heading down that peninsula there, you've got more of a chance of crossing the Antarctic Circle. Doesn't happen all the time. It's always ice dependent. But once you head down there, and that's when the whales are starting to get together for their migration too. So higher numbers of whales possible to see. So not a bad time. It just depends on what you want to see. If, so if you really want to see those baby penguins, get with Jamie and the team at World Away Travel so we can get you there at the right time. Nothing more upsetting to us than we get you down there and you say, where are the babies? And we're like, <laughs> December next year would be a good time to come back. Um, but you do, you're out, you get to go hiking, kayaking, we're out in the zodiacs, the ice. Honestly, you could spend your entire life photographing icebergs and every one of them is different. That The colour is absolutely spectacular. Um, you know, you see those mountains appear out of the ocean as you arrive down in Antarctica, it's just stunning. Leopard seals, Weddell seals, killer whales. Um, it is just the diversity of life in this area is just absolutely spectacular. So you can just do the peninsula, or if you wanna spend a little bit more time, there's the opportunity for South Georgia and the Falklands to be added. And this is where you're going to see, it's, it's like the Serengeti of the Southern Ocean. There's 100,000 king penguins on one beach. And then you've also got that history of Scott and Shackleton and Mawson. Um, this is actually Shackleton's burial site in South Georgia. So we get the chance to learn that history, understand what it was like in his epic journey have a glass of scotch. Lots of drinking of scotch, isn't there, going on here? <laughs> and then we head back to our wonderful ship with hot showers and great food and very comfy bed and feather dunas. So a little different to what he experienced, but it's, it's really amazing to understand the history firsthand. So very, very, very cool. So quick question for you. Um, and I know that a lot of people, they hear the Drake shake or, you know, everybody's worried about the Drake passage. How, how bad is it and, yep. and how long does it take to get through it? Yeah, so look, it's also called the Drake Lake. Um, it has <laughs> two names, Drake Lake or Drake Shake. The key thing here is that we operate ships that are built specifically for this region. These are vessels that are made for this area. They're also helmed by captains who know this area exceedingly well. Um, and safety is always paramount. That's the first thing that goes into every expedition. We're also armed with pretty amazing satellite technology now to track weather. And so look, we don't want to get stuck in weather if we can help it. We want to go around it, leave a little earlier, leave a little later to bypass that. But just know if you do end up in weather, you've got captains at the helm of the ship and you've got ships that are specifically built to handle those conditions. I always laugh because people will be like, oh, I don't want to have any weather. Can you promise? I'm like, yeah, no, I don't have a crystal ball. And, and it's always the ones who are the most vocal about not wanting to hit weather that get down there and have two glass lake crossings. And then they come back and go, I was kind of a bit disappointed. It was really flat. And you just <laughs> want to uh, <laughs> But you know, it, it is, I've been on both. And I can, I can tell you that, you know, once you get over the initial, whoo, that's a big wave. It's like, this is kind of fun. So you shouldn't be afraid of it. It is part of the experience. And honestly, you are one of so few that will ever get the chance to step foot on Antarctica. It's nearly like you've earned your stripes. You know, to arrive, having crossed the Drake Passage, you'll leave Ushuaia, go down the Beagle Channel, turn right into the Drake Passage, and then you overnight, so you're asleep, you wake up the next day, you spend the day learning about Antarctica, what you're going to see. You've got great albatross off the back of the boat. You may start to see some whales or other wildlife. Then you start to see those first hints of ice. You go to bed and you wake up and you're starting to approach. And so the time is used very wisely in preparation for getting there. But if you don't do that crossing, if you don't earn those stripes to get there, it really takes away from seeing those mountains and that peninsula rise up out of the ocean in front of you. It's really quite remarkable. Sure. So we have our peninsula trip, peninsula South Georgia and the Falklands. But if you really want to spend some time in Antarctica, that new ship, the Endurance, is going to do this amazing Ushuaia to the peninsula, along the peninsula, the entire west coast of Antarctica, into the Ross Sea and the Ross Ice Shelf, then all the way up through those sub-Antarctic islands of Macquarie and Auckland and the Snares Island, up into New Zealand. So that's a 36-day odyssey. Um, multiple stops, opportunities to get out and kayak and zodiac and get onto the continent, multiple species of penguin, but 
that is the granddaddy of all trips to Antarctica. So quick question for you, because that seems like the ultimate work from home uh, experience <laughs> right there. Is there Wi-Fi on board? Yes, there is. Um, look, we have Wi-Fi on all of our ships. You're at sea. So, you know, it's satellite dependent. Some days it's brilliant. Some days it's a little spottier than others. But um, when I was in Antarctica, I was able to answer email each day. Now, you're certainly not streaming your favorite Netflix movie. Um, <laughs> that's probably not the way to use your Wi-Fi. Um, but you can get emails in and out. And if we do happen to hit a day where it's down, you know it's going to be up the next day. So, um, you know, the best way to use it whenever, and I'll give you this hint, whenever you're on a ship um, and you're using internet, do everything offline, have it ready to go, log in, get a good signal, get it all out, log off, right? Don't work online. Um, you know, it's only a certain bandwidth, no matter what ship you're on, you're tying up, tying up space and slowing it down for everyone. So if everyone works together, it can be super, super quick to get stuff off and on. Perfect. Yeah. All right. This one's on everybody's list. Galapagos. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so we were actually the very first company to take guests to Galapagos in 67. And actually Lars Eric realized back then how special this place was. And so he actually helped the Ecuadorian government by paying the wages of the first two park rangers to ensure that the park got up and running. He was that passionate and dedicated to protecting these islands because these are little volcanic islands off the coast of Ecuador. And they're all very, very different. People always say to me, well, if you've seen one island, have you seen them all? And it's like, no, they're very different from an endemic wildlife. They're very different from the, the, the geology and the geography. Um, some of them are flat, barren. You feel like you're in a desert environment like North Seymour, scrubby. Then Isabella is lush and green and just beautiful in some of the areas. Fernandina is black ribbon lava. Some have red. Um, sandy beaches, some have glossy white sand. So every island is different. Every island is different from what you're going to see and the quantities you're going to see. Um, North Seymour Island is great for blue-footed boobies when they're breeding and they're on the nest and those little babies are sticking their heads out. Later in the year, you also have frigate birds that nest there. Um, you'll be in the water a lot of the time, great snorkeling, and we provide all the gear. So there's seals and sea lions, and they're swimming close by. There's great fish life, marine iguanas, um, and they absolutely have no fear of you whatsoever. And people kind of roll your, their eyes at you like, yeah, sure. But it is, it is unbelievable. Actually, we had an example. Um, we had a photographer. She was trying to get a photo of a Floriana mockingbird which is a lovely little bird. And um, she had this huge zoom lens on her camera and she's got the camera up and she's filming a bird on a tree a little bit further over. And someone started laughing and she put the camera down, what's funny? Well, what was funny was there was one perched on the end of her zoom lens. So <laughs> I couldn't get any closer than that. We were getting great photos of Floriana Mockingbird. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a remarkable experience. But once again, paddle boarding, kayak, you're in the Zodiacs, you're off every morning, back for lunch, back off in the afternoon. Um, it's just a remarkable wildlife experience. And for every age, those giant tortoises, to be able to see them up close and to understand them, to have moments like this that are just so personal. And once again, this is at the wildlife. Um, level of access. They want to come to you. We do never, never. And we always brief our clients on etiquette around wildlife. We're not touching, we're not going out to find them and get near them. If you sit quietly, they come to you. It's a, it's a bit like you're there in Richmond. They want to know why you're there and what's going on. But um, to be able to snorkel with these amazing little guys, Galapagos penguins, um, they're very quick. Trying to get a photo of those is always a little bit of a blur, but they are absolutely spectacular. So the Galapagos, you know, that we do a 10 day, seven days on the islands and a night pre and post in Ecuador in Waikilo Pito. And it's, it's one of my favorite places. You could go every month and every month. Very cool. Amazing. Yeah. Alaska. This is, you know, every time I think of Alaska and cruise, I think of big ships. And so this is really exciting. It is. And um, we, we like to say um, 
their ships and our ships, right? Um, Alaska for us is all about intimacy of scale. It's not about shopping. It's not about spending time with a couple of thousand of your newest, bestest friends. So if you look at this photo, I love this shot. Um, down the bottom there, you see two very lovely ships, not a bad option, but then you see that little ship in between them. That is us. <laughs> That's a Lindblad experience. So rather than traveling with thousands of people, even 500 people, and being stuck in those big channels in Alaska, this is about going where people aren't, right? We kind of talked about it earlier that this is true social distancing. We don't, <laughs> want, to be, we don't want to be with other people. We just want to be with our little community out in these tiny little passageways surrounded by otters, um, looking up at the trees and seeing so many bald eagles. They look like little Christmas decorations. You see so many white heads. Being out in a zodiac or a kayak and having a whale come up alongside you. Um, having, I remember one morning we were coming in and there were so many otters around the ship. You just didn't, you had otter whiplash. You just didn't know where to look and they've got all their little babies sitting on top of them. And so for us, it's about ensuring people understand the beauty of Alaska, the wildness, the wildlife that's in front of you. Because um, that's what it's about, right? It's about understanding it, being with naturalists, marine biologists, understanding how smart a killer whale is. I mean, these guys are extremely smart. Being close to bear, being on a kayak, along the coast and seeing these guys hunting for salmon in the streams or when they first come down at the beginning of the season, digging for clams, going ashore later in the afternoon and finding their footprints are this big, right? And being able to sit down and discuss how big that bear must be in weight. Um, you know, but one of the things I think we always miss in all the places we go, but I found particularly in Alaska, is we go looking for the big animals. We go looking for the bear and the killer whales and the seals. And you forget that right beneath your feet is this amazing smaller world. And we actually had um, an amazing expedition leader on board who studies moss and lichen. Um, and yes, there are people who spend their entire life studying moss and lichen. And she got us down and we had a group of about 12 that did a five mile hike, the longest hike we did around Lake Eva. She had us down her hands and feet parting the grasses. And beneath our feet was this amazing little world of tiny little orchids and tiny little plants. There's even tiny little insect eating plants, you know, the trapdoor type. And so within this little like four square inches was an, a tiny little Lilliputian world beneath our feet that no one sees unless someone makes you get down on the ground and look at it. And I think that's what an expedition does. It opens your eyes to not just the big things that are easier to see, but to every level of a destination. So you, you really understand it. And so we do everything from a, a six day to a 14 day in Alaska from a very active um, to a more relaxed experience. We even have started um, this past year, one of my new favorite trips is to see the spirit bears. And the spirit bear is the white um, grizzly bear or right, white brown bear. And those are on the um, coast of British Columbia. And so that is to be the opportunity to see them is absolutely remarkable. And I will make a point here. These are not animatronic right? We don't go places where the animal is going to pop up at two o'clock and it's going to be there. We know through experience uh, from our team, the best places to be. But when you approach any kind of expeditionary experience, you approach that from the, 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 the honor of being in these places is trip enough. When you get to see something like a spirit bear or you have a huge experience with lots of polar bear or you get a, to see a blue whale, that is the icing on the cake. And so just being in these places remote and remarkable is enough. But when you get these things, that's what makes it really, really special. Wow. Mm -hmm. So one of the other places we go is the Arctic. And this always, it always kind of blows my mind because people will talk about Antarctica and it's kind of the one place to go. But then they'll ring me and they'll say, oh, I want to go and see the Arctic. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Would you like to say? Because um, it is a plethora of these really cool places. I mean, you can go to Svalbard and you can see polar bears. You can go to Norway and see the coast. You can go to Iceland. Iceland is 
absolutely spectacular. And not just the, the key places that people talk about, like Reykjavik is great, but get up to the highlands, go to Flate Island, get up to Grimsey Island. Um, you know, you've got the Latraberg Cliffs, absolutely stunning places around Iceland that you won't see unless you're on a small ship. Greenland, the coast of Greenland, huge glaciers, amazing little inlets, brilliant wildlife. And so we have multiple itineraries from Norway, Greenland, Iceland, Svalbard, um, Grimsey Island, the Faroe Islands, uh, Shetland, Shetlands and the Orkneys down towards Scotland. And then we had the granddaddy trip, which is kind of the the book, shell, the book um, ends that you would say between our Antarctica epic is our Northeast Passage. And this takes you all the way from Tromso in Norway into Russia, so Murmansk, across the top of Russia. So think beluga whales and narwhals and polar bear and, and um, amazing seal life and bird life. And then you end up all the way over in Nome, Alaska. So this is 26 days over the top of Russia. And the only reason we can do this trip is because of that new ship, the National Geographic Endurance, and the way that she can explore and be self-sufficient. That's incredible. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's, look, there's a lot of other places we go and we could talk for hours, honestly. One of the great places we go is Baja, California, the gray whales the opportunity to get close to these gentle giants you know the mothers give birth to their babies in magdalena bay it's one of the bays where they give birth and if you're really really lucky when you're out on the zodiacs those mothers will push those babies to the surface so you can see they're young um, and if you're really lucky and they bring them up alongside you might get a chance to reach out and give them a scratch which you can do with gray whales can't do that with humpbacks but you can with grays um, and then just the Sea of Cortez is stunning. Uh, also Costa Rica and Panama, you know, those beautiful beaches, amazing national parks as you come along the coast of Costa Rica. And then being able to enter the Panama Canal on a small boat and understand the workings of the canal. Um, all the way over to places like Belize with fantastic diving that we have a, has an opportunity. The South Pacific, we go out to Easter Island, up through the islands to uh, Tahiti. We do uh, the tour motos. There's diving on all of these trips to dive masters on the National Geographic Orion and across to the Marquesas Islands, which are absolutely stunning as well. Um, so just so many remarkable places and top that off with places like Egypt where we're on the Nile. Um, and, and that's just touching on the many, many places that we visit around the world with our teams of, you know, expedition teams and all those great, that great equipment. But the one key thing to take away about an expedition is that it is all about that, that very important balance between the size of the ship, the equipment that you have on there that allows you to see deeper and look further into the places and understand it, um, it, that's really important because as the ship gets bigger, you lose that. So that's why we're always going to stay at that small, intimate sizing. Awesome. So I have a couple, we have a couple questions that have popped in um, and that we also got prior to. If anybody has any questions, um, there's a, a thing on the bottom that says Q&A. You can type them in there and uh, Sarah will get them. And if we can answer them during this time, we will. If we can't answer them, then somebody from the World Away team will absolutely reach out to you to, to discuss further. Um, so one of the questions that we had was, um, and, and we didn't talk about this one, so I'm, I'm gonna test you here, Lisa. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. When you're in Antarctica and the Arctic, what happens if there's a medical emergency? What is, how do you get out? Are there doctors on board? How's that? We do, we have a doctor on board. All of our trips uh, in international waters has a doctor on staff and that's included in your expedition fare. So there's no extra charge to go down and see him. He is well stocked with Dramamine. Um, they are brilliant doctors. Often they're emergency room doctors because those are the kind of docs that can take a couple of months off. They don't have a, a practice where they need to be. Um, and so they are there to help. And if we have someone that is hurt, um, Antarctica, you know, usually if we're on our way down and there's a ship coming back, we will talk with them and they will take a passenger back because um, airlift from down there is, is mighty difficult. Um, up in 
The Arctic, it's a little easier because usually you're within a closer proximity to be able to get someone somewhere where they need to be. But our team is exceedingly well versed in that and getting people where they need to be if there is an emergency. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, another question for you. So now I understand that Limblad has been, a lot, been around for quite some time, but we hear so much about expedition cruising these days. Is Lindblad luxury? How does it compare to some of the other players that, that have entered the market recently? Yeah, so I'm gonna take a little step back because I think this is, I kind, I kind of find it a little humorous. Um, I would nearly, I'm sure I, well, I might not get into trouble, but I would nearly say we're kind of the Beatles of the expeditionary genre, right? We've been around for 53 years playing in clubs and bars. Um, we've always known this is the best way to travel and, the, and the, the, the most exciting way to do it. And all of a sudden, everyone thinks it's the newest, hottest thing out there, right? Um, look, we, for us, luxury is access. It is the luxury of access, and that's why our ships are going to stay smaller and more focused on being able to get into these remote places. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have beautiful white marble bathrooms on the Orion, and you don't have feather dunas and luxury linen sheets, cotton sheets, and you know wonderful warm bathrobes, and a wellness specialist to do morning stretch classes and fitness centers to work out in. But as soon as you start making your guest rooms a thousand square feet or having six, kitchen, six um, restaurants, the ship has to get bigger and then something has to give. So for us, it's about, once again, looking at that scale and that it's a very delicate balance between access and then being more of a cruise ship. We choose to have the access, yet on wonderful ships built specifically to go to the places we go to, um, and the, if you get a chance, look at the National Geographic Endurance. She has the most spectacular guest rooms, gorgeous bathrooms, but on a, on a scale that allows us to do all of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then another question that we had is, what is the daily schedule like on the ship? Yeah, so you ready? So, um, usually you're woken up by our expedition leaders, and I wish this was something you could download on your phone when you get back because in your cabin, you have a little dial that says, do I want to be woken up early or do I want the full ship experience when it's time for us all to get out of bed? So you either turn that off and on and then your expedition leader will come on and they'll say, good morning, good morning. This is your expedition leader. This morning we've pulled into and then they'll tell you where you are. And they have the most gorgeous, calming voice. Um, and then you get up, you either get up early and you go do the stretch class with our wellness specialist, get some early morning coffee, head up and check out the bridge, see what's happening. Or you wake up with everybody else and then we have our breakfast and breakfast is a buffet, but then cook to order elements as well. There'll be omelets and there'll be the most beautiful pastry items, um, you know, wonderful cappuccinos, lattes, whatever you like. I still believe the best cappuccinos can be found at sea at Limblad. Um, and, then, and I'm an Australian, so we know our cappuccino, I'm just saying. Um, and then um, you will, because of the night before, you will have chosen what you want to do this morning and they will start to announce. So you'll go back, get your bag with your camera kit in this plastic baggies, get wet. Um, and then you will head down with your life jacket to get on your Zodiac and go for your activity that morning. Once you've come back at lunchtime, there's a great buffet, lots of options. Um, and we do a buffet because people are coming back at staggered times. It allows everyone to have fresh and plentiful lunches. And then you'll go out again in the afternoon. Um, and then when you come back, you've got some time to drop off your bags, maybe change into something a little bit more casual than your expedition gear. And then there'll be the announcement for you to come up for recap and recap is where we do our talk about what did we see today? Maybe see some of that underwater video footage, talk to our photographers, have a presentation on perhaps glacial movement up in Alaska, um, if that's where you are. And then you'll all proceed. And there's always hors d'oeuvres, um, served during the recap, then you'll head to dinner and everyone sits down and that's where the conversation starts. Your expedition team will join you at dinner time, our photographers, our global guest speakers, and it is not a rushed affair. It is all about just sit back, relax, enjoy this amazing food and cuisine and wine. Um, and then we all head to the bar or the expedition team will head up to the lounge to see who's going to come. And there's a great library. You can work on your photography. We have 
um, Apple computers to download and work on some of your images. Um, and you'll, but you'll find most people just go, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. I'm going to head to bed because I know I want to get up tomorrow morning and do this all again. Um, otherwise, you'll find us up in the lounge or you'll find folks up on the bridge with the captain. So it's not about shows. It's not about dancing. It is really about taking the time to appreciate the places. I will tell you, when I was up in Alaska last year, on the last night, we all came back from dinner and they announced that there were some uh, humpback whales in the bay in front of us. It ended up to be about 30 or 40 humpbacks just um, feeding on the surface. So they weren't doing big tail flips, but they were just coming all around us. And as you, if you can imagine, it was this soft light, the mountains were all pink, and you could just hear psh, psh, all around the ship. And as it got darker, it just got to the point, that's all you could hear were these whales. And, and so that's your enrichment. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but no show beats that. So um, that's, your, that's your average day if there can be such a thing on a Limblad expedition. Awesome. Well, Lisa, I, I thank you. I don't have any more questions at this time, but I just really want to thank you for the time that you've given us. I'm sorry the the grandfather clock is going off in the back. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, and you know, to, to everybody that's been on, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any other questions, um, please feel free to, to email us or reach out to your advisor at World Away. We are all working remotely at this time, but we're all available for, for anything that you need. And um, I have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And for those of you that are joining us, we are um, gonna meet with one of our other uh, partners on Thursday about the national parks. And then we also have one scheduled next week for a, a really special resort up in Montana. But Lindblad, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.